Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Juggler66, Hour of the Truth. This one's called, as you can see, Foreign Missions and the Jesuits in the European Society and is another video in the series of the reading of the book The Secret History of the Jesuits by the French author Edmond Paris uh, from 1975 was that publication, as you probably know already. And without any further ado, we go into the last part of Chapter 2, the Americas, the Jesuit state of Paraguay, under the Foreign Missions section. The Jesuit state of Paraguay. Maybe you have heard of it, maybe you have not heard of it. This deals with the reductions of Paraguay, or the reducciones, as they are also called. This is the f experiment, you can almost say, that the Jesuits did during the 16th and 17th century in the state of Paraguay in Latin America <coughs> where they actually um, put into practice for the very first time what they think of communism. And you will actually see while reading this how many resemblance we have to the world that we live in today when you see how the Jesuits acted with their uh, with their foreign mission, in this case, the Jesuit state of Paraguay. The missionaries of the Society of Jesus found the New World much more favorable to their proselytism than Asia. There, they found no old and learned civilizations, no religions solidly established, nor any philosophical traditions, but only poor and barbarian tribes, unarmed spiritually, as well as temporarily before the white conquerors. Now the author says <laughs> the new world was much more favorable to their proselytism than Asia. The Roman Catholic Church does not proselytize. <laughs> the Roman Catholic Church, first and for all, is a political power. And the state is obedient to the church. We are all made Catholics through canon law that is uh, uh, opposed on us by the state. But here, in this case, they really went in there to make Catholics, or as they call it, make Christians, from these so-called barbarian tribes, unarmed spiritually as well as temporarily before the white conquerors, because that's what they are. They are not proselytizers, and surely not in the name of Jesus Christ. They are conquerors, as the author says here, and that is where we should really put the emphasis on. Now, only Mexico and Peru, with the memory of Aztec and Inca gods still fresh in their minds, resisted this important, uh, important religion for quite a long time. So they were not to be proselytized so easy, because they had their own Inca and Aztec belief system, and they had their own pagan gods, and they didn't want to give up their pagan gods. Why not? Because a pagan god is no god. Whether the old Aztec god or the old Inca god is no god, and the god of Roman Catholicism is no god either. But anyway, they were clinging on to that and were kind of resistant against the Jesuits and the other white conquerors at that time. Anyway, the author continues here, also the Dominicans and Franciscans had already established themselves solidly. The Dominicans, yes, where do we know the, the Dominicans from? From the Inquisition. The Dominican Order was the Order of the Inquisition. And they, of course, when they came to the new lands, well, they proselytized on the Inquisition manner. Meaning, convert or die. It was then amongst the wild tribes, nomadic hunters and fishermen, that the sons of Loyola exercised their devouring activity. The results they obtained varied according to the fierceness and opposition of the various populations. And Canada, the Hurons, peaceful and docile, accepted easily their catechism, but their enemies, the Iroquois, attacked the stations created around Fort Saint-Marie, huh? Saint-Marie, Saint-Marie, 
and massacred the inhabitants. The Hurons were practically exterminated within ten years and, in 1649, the Jesuits had to leave with about 300 survivors. They did not make a strong impression when they went through the territories which today make up the United States, and it was only during the 19th century that they started putting some roots down in that part of the continent. In South America, the Jesuits' action met with some good and bad fortunes. In 1546, the Portuguese had called them to work in the territories they possessed in Brazil. While converting the natives, they encountered many conflicts with civil authority and other religious orders. The same thing happened in New Granada, Grenada, but Paraguay was the land for the great experience of Jesuitical colonization. <sighs> experience. <laughs> we can say, as we read along, you will understand that, that that experience, yeah, that was an experience for the native people there, Paraguay was the land of the great experience of Jesuitical colonization. They were using the population as guinea pigs, if it were. Guinea pigs for their communism that they implanted on those people. This country spread then from the Atlantic to the Andes and compromised territories which today belong to Brazil, Uruguay and Argentina. So the Paraguay of the Antiquities, as we can almost call it, huh, that the author is speaking about here, that Paraguay is much, much bigger than that small country as it is known today. The only means of access through the virgin jungle was on the Paraguay and Parana rivers. The population of that land was made up of nomadic and docile Indians, ready to bow to anyone's domination as long as they were supplied with enough food and little tobacco. Is there any resemblance that you see to today's life? As long as the state provides your food, as long as the state provides your tobacco or your alcohol, aren't you satisfied? Listen, look around to you what society today has become. Totally dependent on the state and this exactly was their quote-unquote experiment they did here in Paraguay. These Indians were, bow were ready to bow to anyone's domination as long as they were supplied with enough food and a little tobacco. So as long as you give me what I need, I'm going to do anything you want. I even bow down to your pagan gods. Right? Isn't that what people do today? As long as they have enough food and enough shelter and to eat, to drink and a little tobacco or alcohol here to set up their minds, they don't care what happens for the rest. And the Jesuits know this and they experience this already in the 16th and 17th century in Paraguay with so-called docile Indians. But... <laughs> Docile Indians in the 16th and 17th century, and century uh, uh, 16th and 17th century are not that much different <laughs> from brainwashed people in Western society in the 21st century. <laughs> the Jesuits could not find better conditions to establish away from the corruptions of white and half castes the perfect type of colony, a city of God, according to their heart's desire. Yeah, what God? The God of the Jesuits, which is not the God of the Bible, but is Satan, the prince of the air and the God of this world, according to the Bible. At the start of the 17th century, Paraguay was made into a province by the general of the order who had been given all powers by the court of Spain and the Jesuit state developed and flourished. What does that mean that the general of the order of the Society of Jesus had been given all powers by the court of Spain? That means that the court of Spain, the Spanish king, made the general of the order of the Society of Jesus guard over that country. 
he could rule as he wished. He had been given all powers. So, um, I don't think that there is much difference between what <laughs> the people in power in our countries that rule today do because they have been given all the power by the Pope because as the Bible says, the whole world wandered after the beast and she reigns over the kings of the earth. And here it is, the general of the order of the Society of Jesus who had been given all powers by the court of Spain and so the Jesuit state developed and flourished. But developed and flourished, you have to see who profited from that. Surely not the poor Indian souls. These good savages were duly catechized and, uh, catechized and trained to live a sedentary life under a discipline as gentle as it was strong, quote, as an iron hand in a velvet glove. Yes, isn't that exactly what we do have today? An iron hand in a velvet glove? That is how people are directed and led even today in our societies today. As long as you adhere to what the government says, as long as you do what the state says, everything is fine. You only feel the velvet glove. But if you have any kind of opposition and really search for the truth and see that you, are been, that you have been living a lie and been sold a lie, then the iron hand comes out of the velvet glove and you will feel and experience the harshness and the brutality of the state coming down on you. These patria, uh, patria <laughs> this easy word, these patriarchal societies deliberately ignored liberties of any kind. Quote, all that a Christian possesses and uses, the hut in which he lives, the fields he cultivates, the livestock which provides his food and clothes, the arms he carries, the tools he works with, even the only table knife given to every young couple when they set up home is to bambak, means God's property. <laughs> Who's God? The God who provides the people. The state becomes God. It's all God's property. Not the God of the Bible we are talking here. We are talking about the state who makes himself God in this case. From the same conception, the Christian cannot dispose of his time and person freely. The suckling child is under his mother's protection. As soon as he can walk, he is in the father's of their, angel, uh, of their agent's power. When the child grows up, it learns, if it is a girl, to spin and weave, if it is a boy, to read and write, but only in Guarani. For Spanish is severely prohibited, as to the prevent all trading with the corrupted Creoles. As soon as a girl is 14 and the boy 16 years of age, they are married, as the fathers are anxious not to see them fall into some carnal sin. None of them can become priest, monk, and even less a Jesuit. They have practically no liberty left. But they are obviously very happy, materially speaking. In the morning, after Mass, each gang of workers go to the fields one after another, singing and preceded by some holy image. In the evening they come back to the village in the same manner, to hear the catechism or recite the rosary. The fathers have also thought out some honest entertainments and recreation for the quote-unquote Christians. Isn't that exactly the kind of slavery state that we live in nowadays in the 21st century? In the morning you do your rituals, then you go to work, then in the evening you come back and in the meantime, the fathers also thought out some honest entertainments and recreations for you. Because you go back to your computer gaming, to your television on the television shows, to your movies from Hollywood getting indoctrinated. 
or whatever leisure, entertainment or recreations the state provides for you. You can do anything as long as it is quote-unquote legal, as long as it has quote-unquote a license. You can gamble, you can do anything you want. That's exactly what it is today, right? Where's the difference between the 16th and the 17th century here in Paraguay and the world that we live in today? In the morning after Mass. So, even if you're not a Catholic, then just in the morning after all your ritual that you are doing in the morning, each gang of workers go to the fields one after another or you go to your office, singing along with a song in your car preceded by some holy image that you have because of your spiritual exercises imaginations in the evening you come back at home in the same manner to hear the catechism or recite the rosary well to be indoctrinated by today's spiritual exercises and ratio studiorum to the point of the art art of the st of the state of the art of the jesuits today in the 21st century and in the meantime the Fathers, the wonderful Jesuits who take so good care of you, have thought of entertainments for recreation. Sports, sport television, all that stuff. Think of whatever you do in your so-called free time. A. As long as you please do not read books like this or even the Bible. God forbid that you pick up a Bible and read the Word of God and all of a sudden understand in what kind of deception you are living. Boma, who we already cited before, says here, quote, The Jesuits watch over them like fathers, and like fathers also, they punish the smallest mistakes. The whip, fasting, prison, pillory on this public square, public penance in the church, these are the chastisements they use. So the quote-unquote red children of Paraguay, know no other authority than that of the good fathers. They do not even vaguely suspect that the king of Spain is their sovereign. Unquote. Now the author says, listen closely, is this not a picture somewhat caricatured, the perfect picture of the ideal theocratic society? Is not that actually that he says a mirror of what we have today, as I already tried to tell you? Is this not a picture of somewhat caricatures, the perfect picture of the ideal theocratic society? Ideal to whom? To the Antichrist. I have not mentioned him yet, but I think it is obvious, right? The Antichrist of the Bible, the papacy in Rome, is the head of the Jesuit orders. And they do his bidding, and he does their bidding. They all work together. Whether now the white pope is under control of the black pope or not, I won't even discuss that at this point, that is of absolutely no importance, but the point is that the Roman Catholic Church, the Antichrist of the Bible, in this way makes his ideal theocratic society. They did it experimentally in the 16th and 17th century in Paraguay, and today they do the same thing all over the world. And the people just do not see it because when they come back from their work, the fathers already sought out, thought out some honest entertainment and recreations for the so-called Christians. <laughs> but let us consider how it affected the intellectual and moral advancement of the beneficiaries of that system, these poor innocents, as they were called, by the Marquess de Lerotto. Quote, the mission's high culture is nothing more than an artificial product from a hothouse, carrying in itself a seed of death. Because, in spite of all this breaking in and training, the Guarani remained deep down what he was, 
a lazy savage, narrow-minded, sensual, greedy and sordid. Actually, these are the basic instincts of every person. As the fathers themselves say, he only works when he feels the overseer's goat behind him. <laughs> I know a lot of people in this society here in Belgium where I live today who are just the same. As long as they feel the rod of the boss behind them, they work, they function. The moment the cat is from the house, the mouses dance on the table. Have you heard that expression before? <laughs> so, in spite of all this breaking in and training, the Guarani remained deep down what he was, a lazy savage, narrow-minded, sensual, greedy and sordid. As the fathers themselves say, he only works when he feels the overseer's goat behind him. As soon as they are left to themselves, they are indifferent to the fact that the harvest is rotting in the field, implements are deteriorating and the herds are scattered. If he is not watched when working in the fields, he can even suddenly unyoke an ox and butcher it on the spot, light a fire with the wood of the plow and with his companions start eating the half-cooked flesh until none of it is left. He knows, of course, that he will get twenty-five flashings of the whip for it, but also that the good fathers would never let him starve to death. In a book recently published, we can read the following concerning the Jesuits' punishments. Quote, the culprit, dressed in the clothes of a penitent, was escorted to church when he confessed his fault. Then he was whipped on the public square according to the penal code. The culprits always received this chastisement not only with murmurs, but also with thanksgivings. Unquote. And further, quote, The guilty one, having been punished and reconciled, kissed the hand of the one who struck him, saying, May God reward you for freeing me by this light punishment from the eternal sorrows which threatened me. Unquote. After reading this, we can understand Mr. Burma's conclusion that reads, quote, The Guarani's moral life enriched itself very little under the father's discipline. He became a devout and superstitious Catholic who sees miracles everywhere and seems to enjoy flagellating himself until blood appears. He learned to obey and was attached to the good fathers who cared so well for him with a filial gratitude which even though not very deep, was nevertheless very tenacious. This not very brilliant result proves that there was some important defect in the educative methods of the fathers. Now, what was that defect? The fact that they never tried to develop in their red children the inventive faculties, the need for activity, the feeling for responsibility, they themselves invented games and recreations for their Christians. They thought for them instead of encouraging them to think for themselves. They merely submitted those who were under their care to a mechanical breaking instead of educating them. Unquote. I'm going to read this again and do a little comment of this last sentence. What was the defect? The fact that they never tried to develop in their red children the Indians, the inventive faculties, the need for activity, the feeling of responsibility, they themselves invented games and recreations, the fathers, for their Christians, they thought for them, instead of encouraging them to think for themselves. Hello! In what world li are we living today? People are not used to think for themselves anymore. That is the big problem because everything is done for them because other people think for them and other people tell them what to do. And people become like that, docile, like the Indians here, and don't think of themselves and come to ideas for themselves anymore. They don't look into history to understand the present and make predictions to the future. They don't read the Bible, they don't read the Word of God because other people think for them and tell them what to read and tell them what to think and tell them what to study and the Bible does not belong to that. 
the Jesuit fathers thought for their pupils, uh, but instead of encouraging them to think for themselves, they merely submitted those who were under their care to a mechanical breaking in instead of educating them. They thought for them instead of encouraging them to think for themselves. That is exactly what our society for more than 100 years is. It's exactly the same thing. Other people think for you, other people tell you what to do, and as long as you think in their lines, you can do whatever you want. But don't think outside of the box. Then you get in trouble. How could it be otherwise, when they themselves had gone through a breaking in, lasting 14 years, speaking of the Jesuitical education? Of course you are going to implement on others that what has been implemented on you. So the Jesuit training for 14 years, of course, gave them the direction they had to give to the Indians. They have been made, as you can read in the Jesuit oath, people who have no will and no conscience of their own. That is what the spiritual exercises are for in the Jesuitical training that they run through for at least 14 years. And that's of course what they impose on the people they rule. Were they going to teach the Guaranis and their white pupils to think for themselves when they were absolutely forbidden to do so themselves? <laughs> Hello? Were they going to teach the Guaranis and their white pupils? You see, that's what we are today. To think for themselves when they were absolutely forbidden to do so. If I am forbidden to think for myself, how can I teach somebody else to do it? It is not a Jesuit of old, but a contemporary who writes, quote, He, the Jesuit, will not forget that the characteristic virtue of the company is total obedience of the action, the will, and even the judgment. All the superiors will be bound in the same way to higher ones and the Father General to the Holy Father. It was so arranged as to render the Holy See's authority universally efficacious. Universally read also Catholic efficacious, and St. Ignatius de Loyola was sure that teaching and education would henceforth bring back to Catholic unity a Europe torn apart." Unquote. Now, it is with the hope of reforming the world, wrote Father Bonheur, that he particularly embraced this means, the instruction of youth. Now, the instruction of youth, this is a quotation from a book from F. Charmont from the Society of Jesus, and the book is called La Pédagogie des Jésuites. La Pédagogie des Jésuites, that is the pedagogy of the Jesuits, meaning the art or the science of teaching, education, instructional methods, that is, Gnostic teaching, that is, Pedagogy, that is Gnostic teaching, everything but the Bible, everything but the true word of God. The education of Paragraph's natives was done on the same principles the fathers used to apply, now apply, and will apply on everyone and everywhere. Interesting sentence, eh? Because this just puts together, emphasizes what I have been saying for the last half hour. The education of Paragraph's natives was done on the same principles the fathers used to apply, now apply and will apply on everyone and everywhere where they rule. 
and the Jesuits, the Roman Catholic Church, rules everywhere. She rules over the kings of the earth, the Bible says. Their aim, deplored by Mr. Burma, but which is ideal to the eyes of those fanatics, the renouncement of all personal judgment, all initiative, a blind submission to the superiors. Is it not that height of freedom, the liberation from one's own bondage, praised by R. P. Roquette, and which we mentioned earlier on? In fact, the good Guaranis had been quote unquote liberated so well by the Jesuitical method for more than one hundred and fifty years that when their masters left during the eighteenth century, the Guaranis went back into their forests and returned to their ancient customs as if nothing had happened. It all was just as a bad dream of history, going on as if nothing ever happened. Isn't that the same as today? The world today acts like those atrocious things like the Second World War, like the Vietnam War, like even the Iraq War in the 90s with 500,000 dead Iraqi children had not happened. Going on as if nothing ever happened, the same as it is today. The Guaranis went back into their forest and the people go back into their houses. Nothing to see here, nothing happened. Let's just carry on. The next part of the book is called The Jesuits in the European Society and chapter one of this is called The Teaching of the Jesuits and we will read these few little pages to end this video today. The Teaching of the Jesuits. The pedagogic method of the company, wrote R. R. Uh, R. P. Charmot, which, who is a member of the Society of Jesus, consists first of all of surrounding the pupils with a great network of prayers. Later he quotes the Jesuit father Tacchini, quote, May the Holy Spirit fill them as alabasters are filled with perfumes. May he penetrate them so much that, as time goes on, they will be able to breathe in more and more celestial fragrance and the perfume of Christ." Unquote. Father Gandier who also has a contribution. Listen. Quote, Let us not forget that education, as seen by the company, is the ministry most similar to that of angels. Unquote. Do you understand what this father, quote unquote father, <coughs> call no man your father? There's only one your father who is in heaven. What this quote unquote father Gandier said here? Let us not forget that education as seen by the company is the ministry most similar to that of angels. They are doing angel-like work. They are doing God's work with their quote-unquote education, their gnostic education, their learning against learning education that takes away the word of God, that takes away everything the Bible stands for and the Bible itself and corrupt it even though when you can read it. And they call that a godly work because it is similar to the ministry of angels. Later Father Charmot has this to say, quote, Let us not be anxious as to where and how mysticism is inserted into education. It is not done through a system of artificial technique, but by infiltration, by endosmosis. The children's souls are impregnated because of their being in close contact with masters who are literally saturated with it." Unquote. And I don't have to explain the sentence because we will go a little bit deeper into this when we read on in this chapter. From the same author, Father Charmond, here is, quote, the aim of the Jesuit professor, quote, through his teaching, he aims to form not an intellectual Christian elite, but elite 
Christians. Unquote. So I hope you understood this. This quote unquote Father Shamot says through his teaching, the Jesuit, yeah, he aims to form not an intellectual Christian elite, but elite Christians. Now, can you tell me what the difference is between an intellectual Christian elite or an elite Christian? <laughs> An intellectual Christian elite would be well studied in the word of God, would be very well studied in the truth, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They would be true followers of the one true God of the Bible. Whereas elite Christians would be the perfect brainwashed followers of Catholicism, perfectly adhering to their superiors. Now these few quotations that we just read tell us enough about the principal aim of these educators. Let us see now how they form these elite Christians and what kind of mysticism is inserted or inoculated, infiltrated or pumped into children submitted to their educational system. How do they indoctrinate the people? At the front it is characteristic of this order of Jesuits, we find the Virgin Mary. Quote, Loyola had made the Virgin the most important thing in his life. The worship of Mary was the base of his religious devotions and was handed down by him to his order. This worship developed so much that it was often said, and with good reason, that it was the Jesuits' real religion." Unquote. The Jesuits' real religion is the veneration and worshipping of Mary. Mary, the Mary as you know her from the Roman Catholic Church, is Semiramis, is the Queen of Heaven, as Jeremiah said in chapter 7 and chapter 44, when you want to read about who the Queen of Heaven really is in the Word of God, in the Bible. This pagan goddess, that religion, that worshipping is the Jesuits' real religion. This was not written by a Protestant, but this was written by J. Huber, professor of Catholic theology from the horse's mouth itself. Loyola himself was convinced that the Virgin had inspired him when he had drawn up his exercises. A Jesuit had a vision of Mary covering the society with her mantle as a sign of her special protection. Another one, Rodrigue de Gua, was so enraptured with her inexpressible beauty that he was seen soaring into the air. A novice of the order of the Jesuits, who died in Rome in 1581, was sustained by the Virgin in his fight against the devil's temptations. To strengthen him, she gave him a taste of her son's blood from time to time and the comfort of her breasts. Duns Scott's doctrine of the Immaculate Conception was enthusiastically adopted by the order, which was successful in having it made into a dogma by Pope Pius IX in 1854, and a little than a hundred years later by Pope Pius XII, we have the Assumption of Mary. Here you have, in, in the 19th century, the Immaculate Conception, that was made Catholic dogma, and less than a hundred years later, in 1950, by Pope Pius V, you have the Assumption of Mary made Catholic dogma. Who do the Catholics really worship? The God of the Bible or the Queen of Heaven? Quote, Erasmus satirically depicted the worship of Mary of his time. During the 4th century, a tale of Loretto's house had been invented. This house had apparently been brought from Palestine by angels. The Jesuits welcomed and defended this legend. Canisius went as far as producing letters from Mary herself and, thanks to the order, great wealth started to pour in at Loreto, as it did at Lourdes in France, at Fatima and other places where the so-called Virgin Mary appeared. 
If you have not heard of the House of Loretto, then go to my reading of Babylon Mystery Religion. This is uh, the house of so-called the family of Jesus that has been brought by angels over from Palestine to Rome, somewhere there. I mean, I don't get the facts anymore, but <laughs> just go to Babylon Mystery Religion. You can look that up or check it out on yourself, the house of Loretto. And they even have that standing there still today. Quote, the Jesuits brought forth all kinds of relics of the Mother of God. When they made their entrance into the church of St. Michael at Munich, they offered to the veneration of the faithful pieces of Mary's veil, several tufts of her hair and pieces of her comb. They instituted a special cult consecrated to worship these objects. This worship degenerated into licentious and sensual manifestations, in particular in the hymns dedicated to the Virgin by Father Jacques Pontanus. The poet knew of nothing more beautiful than Mary's breasts, nothing sweeter than her milk, and nothing more delightful than her abdomen. Unquote. One could multiply these citations endlessly. Ignatius of Loyola wanted his disciples to have a perceptible or even sensual piety, similar to his own, and the obvious and they obviously succeeded. No wonder they were so successful with the simple Guaranis. This erotic fetishism suited them perfectly, but the good fathers always thought it would suit the whites as well as the foundation of their doctrine is an utter contempt for people as human beings, whites or reds were just the same, and both had to be treated as if they were children. Again, with this little sentence, we sum up everything that I said in my comments already earlier in reading this chapter. So they worked relentlessly at propagating this spirit, which is not the Holy Spirit, people. This are the spirits of devils. They work relentlessly at propagating this spirit and these idolatrous practices because of the influence they hold over the Holy See, which cannot do without them. They force them on the Roman Church in spite of the resistance which had gradually decreased. Quote, Father Barry wrote a book entitled Paradise Opens Through 100 Devotions to the Mother of God. In it, he expounds the idea that the way by which we enter paradise is not important. The important thing is to enter. He enumerates exercises of exterior piety to Mary which open heaven's doors. Amongst other things, these exercises consist of giving to Mary morning and evening salutations, frequently charging the angels to greet her, expressing the desire to build her more churches than all those built by monarchs put together, carrying day and night a rosary as a bracelet, an image of Mary, etc., etc., etc. These practices are enough to assure our salvation, and if the devil, when we are about to die, makes claims on our souls, we just have to remind him that Mary is responsible for us and he must sort things out with her." Unquote. In his Pietas Quotodina Erga as de Mariam, Father Pembel re recommends the following, quote, to beat or flagellate ourselves and offer, each, and, and offer each blow as a sacrifice to God, through Mary to carve with a knife the holy name of Mary on our chest, to cover ourselves decently at night so as not to offend the chaste gaze of Mary, to tell the Virgin you would be willing to offer her your place um, in heaven if she didn't have her own, to wish you had never been born or go to hell if Mary had not been born, to never eat an apple as Mary had been kept from the mistake of tasting of it." Unquote. All this, what I just read, was written in 1764. 
but one only has to glance through similar works published today in great numbers or just the Catholic press to establish the fact that for 200 years this wild idolatry had done nothing but grow and embellish. The late Pope Pius XII, Hitler's Pope, Eugenio Pacelli, distinguished himself as far as the ownership of Mary is concerned. Under his rule, a large part of the Roman Church followed suit. Moreover, the sons of Loyola, who are always anxious to conform to the spirit of the age, try to today to accommodate these medieval puralities, and there are several tracts published by some of, the good, of these good fathers under the grand auspices of the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, which in English means the uh, scientific, uh, National Scientific Centre of Research. Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique. If we add to this the scapulas of various colours with their appropriate virtues, the worship of saints, the worship of images and relics, the apology of the miracles, the adoration of the sacred heart, we will have some idea of the mysticism with which the children's souls are impregnated through their contact with masters who are saturated with it, as R. P. Charmot wrote in 1943. There is no other way to form elite Christians. We are all made so-called elite Christians through the educational system of the Jesuit order, is what these last two pages all went about, and I hope that you understood it. There is no way to, there is no other way, sorry, there is no other way to form elite Christians. Now, what are elite Christians? I'm going to read to you, maybe again, when I'm finding it here in my text. Um, elite Christians would be the perfect brainwashed followers of Catholicism, perfectly adhering to their superiors. This explanation what is the difference between an intellectual Christian elite and elite Christians, that little explanation I wrote for myself from my understanding here, and now you see it being uh, confirmed by the author in the book that we were just reading here. Okay? There is no other way to form elite Christians than through the veneration of Mary. Nevertheless, if they were to win their fight against the universities, the Jesuit colleges had to expand their teaching and include secular subjects, as the Renaissance had awakened a thirst for learning. We know that they gladly carried it out while taking all the necessary precautions to prevent this learning going against the aim of their teaching maintaining the minds in complete obedience to the church. That is why their pupils are first of all surrounded by this great web of prayers, which would not be sufficient if the learning imparted was not carefully purged from all heterodox spirit and, uh, spirit and ideas. So, Greek and Latin, because Latin is regarded very highly in these colleges, Greek and Latin were studied for their literary value, but the antique orthodox thought was expounded just enough to establish the so-called superior scholastic philosophy. These humanists they were training were able to compose discourses and Latin verses, but the only master of their thoughts was St. Thomas Aquinas, a monk of the 13th century, lived between 1225 and 1274 and wrote the monumental work Summa Theologica. You of course know him because I have mentioned him before and if you don't then I advise you to surely look him up. Listen to Ratio Studiorum, fundamental treatise of Jesuit pedagogy, quoted by R. P. Charmot. Quote, 
we will carefully discard secular subjects which do not favor good morals and piety. Piety. We will compose poems, but may our po uh, poets be Christians and not followers of pagans who invoke muses, mountain nymphs, sea nymphs, Calliope, Apollo, etc., or other gods or goddesses. What's more, if these are to be mentioned, may it be with a view of car to caricature them, as they are only demons. Unquote. So, all sciences, and especially natural sciences, will be interpreted in like manner. Now you know what science is all about. In fact, R. P. Charmot doesn't even try to hide it <coughs> in what he said about the Jesuit professor in 1943. Quote, he teaches sciences, not for themselves, but only with a view to bring about, to bring about God's greatest glory. It is the rule laid down by St. Ignatius in his Constitutions. Unquote. Now, I'm going to read that sentence again in a way that you probably better uh, understand it better. He teaches sciences not for themselves, but only with the view to bring about Satan's greatest glory. It is the rule laid down by St. Ignatius in his Constitutions. This is what the sentence actually must read from Mr. Shamo. Not, he teaches sciences not for themselves, but only with a view to bring about God's greatest, greatest glory. No, Satan's greatest glory. It is the rule laid down by St. Ignatius in his constitutions. And again, quote, when we speak of a whole culture, we do not mean that we teach all subjects and sciences, but we give a literary and scientific education which is not purely secular and impermeable to the lights of revelation." Unquote. The instruction dispensed by the Jesuits was therefore bound to be more fleshy than profound or formalistic, as is often called. They did not believe in liberty, which was fatal as far as teaching is concerned, wrote H. Bomer. Yes, because when you, are, when you have liberty, when you have freedom, you cannot be indoctrinated. They did not believe in liberty. That's why they do not teach liberty. The only liberty a Roman Catholic teaches is the liberty to be free to worship as a Catholic. The truth is that the relative merits of the Jesuits' teaching diminished while science and the methods of education and instruction progressed and developed on the basis of a wider and deeper conception of humanity. Buckle said, and I absolutely disagree with this lying person, the more civilization advanced, the more the Jesuits lost ground, not merely because of their own decadence, but because of all the modifications and changes in the minds of those around them. During the 16th century the Jesuits were ahead, but during the 18th century they were behind their time." Unquote. Whoever this buckle is, who is cited here from uh, the Society of Jesus' book from Huber, uh, his work on page 177, whoever this buckle is, he is straight out lying. The more civilization advanced, the more the Jesuits lost ground, <laughs> not merely because of their own decadence, but because of all the modifications and changes in the minds of those around them. Well, they formed the minds of those around them. During the 16th century, the Jesuits were ahead, but during the 18th century, they were behind their time, he says. No, during the 16th century, they were ahead. During the 18th, 19th, 20th, and surely the 21st century, they are miles ahead of the people who cannot even think for themselves anymore because learning against learning, indoctrination and the games that the father provide and the leisures that, they, that the fathers provide, is it via sports, computer games, television, television series, movies, whatever, you pick it. 
has become that way to indoctrinate every person so far that the Jesuits are today so far ahead we cannot even see them anymore. This buckle is a straight out liar and what is written here in this book, this quote, must be made out at this moment as a blatant lie and I hope you understand it because if he were right that would mean that the Jesuits had no say at all about today's 21st century education. So, next time we are going to read in section 5, uh, section 4 of the book, chapter 2, The Morals of the Jesuits. It's going to be very interesting, but uh, I'm going to stop right now here, having brought the former um, chapter to an end the foreign missions and reading the first part of the Jesuits in the European society uh, starting with the teaching of the Jesuits which I hope that you enjoyed and uh, I see you next time when again I read the next part of the book The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris. Until then, Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth signing off. God bless you and bye bye. A specialized work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation and in, in, in through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day. Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine, the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. Of course, both, because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office, he meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope, he said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits, if you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From there on, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, to all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.